My name is Penelope Douglas, as I mentioned, and I'm joined here by three really wonderful and I will tell you, somewhat loquacious colleagues. So um, we have about 55 minutes. Do I have a timekeeper anywhere? Is there anyone who can keep track of? OK, um, it, j just be good to help me out if we're getting close to our time, because I know we agreed that we'd like to leave about um, 10 minutes at least for questions and answers at the end. So we're going to try to keep our, our uh, thoughts uh, so, that, so that we can have chance for that. In any event, I'd like to introduce my colleagues and then I'm going to have them introduce themselves. And just to give you all a little forewarning, given our, uh, uh, David's uh, talk with us just a minute ago, the extra question that I'm going to ask you to answer as part of your introduction is to tell me your favorite myth or story that you read as a child. I think we all are kind of interested in that as part of thinking about how we're going to build new stories, new models. And I promise that we do an icebreaker. So on my immediate left is Jürgen van der Tass with the um, Aga Khan Foundation. He's a deputy director uh, in the um, doing socioeconomic development in both Africa and Asia as part of the Trust for Culture for the Aga Khan Foundation. Next to him is my colleague Nicolas Hazard, who is a senior executive with Group SOS and based in Paris, but working all over the world. He's both the vice president for the group and also CEO of Le Comptoir de l'Innovation. Um, and he will tell you about uh, his uh, hybrid organization. And to his left is Jean-Philippe de Cheval, the CEO of Bamboo Finance. Uh, which is a very successful um, uh, investor in both microfinance and now launching a $200 million impact investing fund. So gentlemen, I'm going to first ask you each, just going right in order, to introduce yourselves and your organization in just one or two minutes, please. And don't forget to tell us your favorite myth or story. Yes. Um, maybe I should start with the last one. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Um, now I come to think of it, maybe my favorite myth is still something I'd like to keep alive, is the moment that my mother told me St. Nicholas or Santa Claus <laughs> doesn't really exist. I'm with you. I, I, I very much lived in the country where I come from, the Netherlands, he has a special status, it's not celebrated at Christmas on the 5th of December. And I was pretty convinced after that story, the next thing he would tell me also that God doesn't exist. So <laughs> It's all uh, downhill, right? <laughs> this is really, um, uh, come to that point. Um, regarding the Aga Khan uh, Trust for Culture, for which I work, it's part of our larger organization, the Aga Khan Development Network. Um, not so much known as a constellation of different organizations because they go by different brand names, but all in all, I represent about 80,000 people. And uh, basically, in uh, revenues to the tune of two and a half billion dollars on an annual basis, um, uh, this network contains a number of activities that are considered the for-profit. Maybe there's a segment you could call the not necessarily not for profit, and they're definitely not for profit. So it's a mix in which uh, these different companies, it includes universities, two universities, it includes airline companies, hotel brands, certainly those are at the for profit side. But again, they're parts of investments in countries where I would normally not make investments. Right. The Trust for Culture, for which I, I work and which I hope also discuss the activities that we are engaged in during the next few days, it's more focused on urban development. Thank you very much. Nicola. Thank you. Uh, I represent a group uh, that is called Group SOS, that is a French-based and a French um, social enterprise. Uh, it's, I think, the, one of the leading social enterprises in uh, Europe. It's the leader in France, definitely. We developed a model for uh, what we called the rich countries, so the, the real developed countries, where we try to fight every kind of exclusion, uh, meaning uh, health, education, unemployment, housing, uh, and so on, by uh, trying to develop activities and social businesses. So we have 44 different kinds of entities uh, throughout France, in overseas departments, but also in 30 countries in the world. Uh, and the result is after 28 years of existence, we are now 10,000 employees, they are full-time uh, employees uh, with an annual turnover of more than 750 million uh, US dollar every year and that's for the last for the last six and seven years we we have a growth of we had a growth of 25 percent and so we're yeah we try to really to find uh, the best solution and we work with public partners and with private partners but we really think it's important to have big social enterprises that are able to fight poverty and we have now just for friends an impact on over one million people so that means that there are 
more than one million people that everywhere, uh, every year, um, benefit from uh, our services. So we're really proud about that. And we just launched uh, two or three years ago a company that is called CDI, Le Comptoir de l'Innovation, as you mentioned, that is the investment company of the group, because we think it's also important to uh, help the other social enterprises to scale. And for my favorite myth, uh, I think the, the one that I always loved is um, is the myth of uh, Ulysse. I don't know the name in English, but uh, it's Ulysse in French, because it's really this kind of adventure. And we, I have uh, going for 10 or 20 years uh, everywhere, trying to fight all the possible monsters. And sometimes I really have the impression <laughs> by doing social entrepreneurship that <laughs> I'm, I'm a kind of Ulysse in this world. So I'm really happy to, to, to share Thank that with you. Thank you very much. Jean-Philippe. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so I work at uh, Bamboo Finance. Bamboo Finance is a um, Geneva-based uh, asset management company. Today, we manage two private equity funds totaling $250 million. We invest in uh, microfinance and other sectors, um, you know, uh, providing access uh, to low-income uh, communities in the world to um, essential goods and services. I mean, affordable housing, healthcare, clean energy, you name it. Um, and we believe that we can combine through our investments, social and financial returns. That's really what, what we really believe in. Um, we're 25 people today, uh, offices in Bogota, Singapore, and opening um, other offices in India and Eastern Africa soon. Um, we come from a tradition of investing in microfinance. I mean, uh, the first company we created was Blue Orchard in 2001. Uh, same idea, you know, very focused investments for impact uh, globally. Um, and the last uh, eight, nine years, we raised close to a billion dollar that we deployed um, through probably 250 microfinance banks worldwide, touching indirectly lives of uh, probably, I don't know, 10, 10 15 million dollars, uh, 10, 15 million people. Thank Sorry. Um, we believe in, uh, you know, in, in, in impact investing. We believe in, um, in, in improving people's lives through uh, intelligent investing and, and generous uh, investing. Um, to come to the story or the, the myth, um, it's more a book. <laughs> and since we were talking about planets at the beginning, uh, I always um, carry with me uh, the Petit Prince uh, from Saint Exupéry. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea, uh, you know, uh, the real things that are really that really matter are invisible for the eyes, and you can only understand and 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 live with your heart. So that's what I like about. Thank you the, very much. Thank you. Well, we're here actually, um, the official reason that we're here to talk to you is because these are all organizations that have achieved scale. And just to make uh, a definition of scale that we can all at least speak to for the discussion we're having with you this morning, I think what we'll use is the definition that basically says, you know, that with scale, with growth, the outputs grow and your efficiency grows as well. So I want to make sure we, we stay true to a real definition of scale as we continue our conversation. However, unbeknownst to all of us, we, um, were, we, we were um, unaware that we were going to also be uh, introduced by a discussion uh, by David about the really important idea of thinking about scope as well as scale. And I think the best way to maybe have us all think about that for our brief discussion is to really think about um, making sure we're solving the problem as opposed to sort of the symptoms and thinking about um, how we are really building new models. So I'm going to really be asking you to focus on those kinds of um, answers when I um, take us through a few questions. Um, and the audience, please think about questions that you have um, and we will be sure we have time for you and I'm looking forward to that as well. The first thing that I wanted to talk about, particularly as we're thinking about building new models is for me, it's really important to know what was the original driving vision or passion. And for one or more of you, that may be your own, but for another, it may be your, your original founder for the Aga Khan himself, for example. But I want to ask each of you to answer this for me. Um, I'm going to start actually in reverse order. Jean-Philippe, start with you. Um, so very, And we're going to have to keep our answers succinct because, we're again, I've got lots of questions for you. But what was the original driving passion or vision? What was that model that you know was in that person's head? Yours, I think. <laughs> It was mine. Um, <laughs> um, I guess it started um, through a long education of uh, caring for others. Um, I think it um, uh, culminated when I was 20 years old, when I spent seven weeks in um, Calcutta, 
um, in, in slums. Um, and from that moment on, I decided I would do something, um, one way or another, I didn't know. <laughs> Um, then, you know, followed the traditional curriculum and then decided um, after having encountered in Tanzania and Guatemala uh, microcredit, microfinance and what it was, it was doing to people's lives to actually try to uh, uh, do something uh, through microfinance. So the real driving you know, force, the motivation behind the creation of Blue Orchard at the time and now Bamboo, um, was having an impact on people's lives. Um, that was, you know, that was the objective. That still is the objective, and and hopefully as many as possible and as efficiently as possible. And then very quickly, um, the idea of the capacity through microfinance to combine, you know, traditional mainstream financial tools and redirect this system to solving, you know, world problem, right. not necessarily challenging the established order but trying to twist it from inside and redirect the flows of capital to where it's most needed in the world so that's that's really you know what what we liked about microfinance and what we're trying to do yes. now with uh, bamboo and private equity so. thank you nicola um driving passion what was the original vision what was the what was the model that was being built the problem it all began actually 28 years ago, so as you can imagine, 28 years ago I was at the kindergarten, <laughs> so I'm not really able to say what was my vision at this time. But uh, the original founder of the very precocious <laughs> of uh, of the of the group SOS actually uh, he he likes to say that he had no vision. But he was just uh, he just had the, he just saw that there were inequalities, that there were very strong, and he wanted, as you mentioned, to do something, but he was not really able to know what he, he would like to do. But then he came to one problem, there were no structure in the early 80s for drug-addicted people. The government, the states, the public sector, they didn't really realize that there were, there were an increasing need for that. So he decided to build the first uh, structure for drug-addicted people. And after a while, uh, he, he was working in another space and he was not really interested basically on the social work but uh, after a while he saw that these drug addicted people they became lots of them were HIV positive and there were no structure for HIV positive people so he decided to to to, to set up uh, inf uh, st structures and entities for HIV positive and this HIV positive didn't have houses because they had difficulties to find houses and then these people didn't have a job and so on so he really so uh, so the, the the approach of group SOS is really um, there is no global vision. It's just like because social needs are moving so fast and so quickly, you always have to adapt, actually. And so you don't necessarily, I think, need a, a global vision. But at the end, uh, for from our point of view, we have this integrated approach of exclusion because we know that every single exclusion is a mix of several exclusions. When you have one person, for example, that is unemployed, he's unemployed maybe because he has also education difficulties, health problems, housing problems, and so on. And poverty is, uh, for, for lots of people, is a vicious circle. And so it's why we decided to do everything. We have more than f 40 different departments for 40 40 different kinds of activities because we know that the, the, the phenomena is more complex than just one answer to one question. Thank you. So j before Yuri and I, I turn to you, obviously what we hear here is not that people sort of come wake up one morning and say, my grand vision, but rather it's this hunger to solve a problem that you see and then it's a, a matter of trying to figure out what part of it you might be able to solve, to get a little deeper into sort of seeing what aspect of it is solvable for your resources, etc. Yurian, how about uh, the Aga Khan Foundation? Well, the, the, original? The, the drive behind the Aga Khan Developer Network, I cannot explain without explaining the Aga Khan in person. And, <coughs> and then we have to go back some time because it was not this Aga Khan, but the grandfather of this Aga Khan, Sultan Aga Khan, who uh, perhaps now already more than 100 years ago, started first activities that were very much linked to education and health. And those are carried out predominantly in what was then British India uh, by groups of volunteers. Those institutions still exist and they're still run by volunteers. So they go back a long, long time. 
With that, of course, there are also communities of people that came from the Indian subcontinent to East Africa. So also in East Africa, these activities are certainly coming close to 80 years already. So there was a lot of thinking in those terms, but this was still at the level of compassion and uh, encouraging people to take their destiny in their own hands, but still at the level that's not really understood the way that development is understood yeah. today. Um, over the years, that has evolved. It has resulted in uh, the different number of organizations in the network, which I mentioned brief, uh, briefly in my introduction, with levels of specialization, and that still come together for activities that are nowadays in jargon called multiple input area development programs. In other words, where all the capacities that are there within the network are thrown in. Um, my own involvement, if I can just add to that, because I'm certainly <laughs> only came at the later stage, <laughs> is, is a more traditional way of traveling abroad, being, um, being uh, impressed by the, uh, negatively impressed, I should say, by the big levels of inequality and um, finding catching up through various organizations and worked for, for this organization where I thought there was a very healthy way of combining uh, business, sometimes regular business, with compassion at the same time. So uh, taking in these different components I felt was the right mix. Before I go to my, my next uh, question, um, is there anything else that any of you feel compelled to say that has to do with sort of connecting this idea of scope? Because next I'm going to sort of talk about you know, how, it, how you get to scale. Any, any burning thoughts or shall we keep our discussion moving? This idea of kind of needing to build a new model, you know, what, how you came to sort of start these organizations. New thoughts? Go ahead, Jean-Philippe. Maybe just a, a quick thought. I mean, um, r recognizing the scope of problems, um, not to fight symptoms, uh, yeah. is of course very important. Yet at the same time, I believe that once you have established your scope, um, and in order that at least the story of Blue Orchard and Bamboo, in order to be very efficient and have impact, you focus, yeah. right? So, scope, yes, but that then very well defined to 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 your objective, and it may very ap appear very uh, very limited or very um, you know uh, not um, encompassing. Yes. Um, and maybe what you're delivering is a little piece of a larger problem, but then you deliver it. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you probably have a tendency of uh, you know spreading too thin your efforts, you don't get anywhere. You have nice you know um, uh, projections or nice uh, presentations, but but then how do you get to the heart and how do you I get to scope? Yeah. So that's what I want to say. I think that's say. an excellent additional point and actually in my own personal experience I would say that the if I were talking about mistakes I'd made along the way, one of them certainly was trying to develop too many solutions, too many products, too many services, because you see, you see so many things to be done. Um, so this idea of scope and then focus in order to start to achieve um, scale. But scale doesn't just happen. It, a lot of the um, work that we do I don't think actually is scalable. And that it isn't our job in this particular panel to talk about how important it is to think about replication, think about new models as opposed to thinking about scale. Our topic is scale. But over the next couple of days, I hope that really, really what will be brought out is a lot of conversation about why scale matters, but also why it doesn't matter in, in some cases. Um, but going on about, about the question of how to get to scale, we talked, each of us, on the phone together, and one of the things that, was, that I really want to bring out to this audience is how long it takes before you actually begin to scale. Um, I think often, particularly in certain parts of the world, um, there, there are kind of skewed views of how quickly one should get where one's going. And, uh, and I think, actually, in this case, Yuri, and I'm going to start with you, because I think the Aga Khan Foundation is a particularly interesting example of living, breathing leadership that's been around for, as you say, over 100 years. Um, do you do you know uh, when it was that you felt the organization was really beginning to achieve a type of scale? Like how many years ago, or how many years of leadership uh, in the Aga Khan's family that took? I I find it difficult to say yeah. um, because by and large the activities have been focused on national scale. So there would be advances in one country, and with no presence in another country, you could not expect to speed up based on the experience you got in the previous country. Right. I think the, the difficulties that you face in, uh, in scaling up is that when monies have to be made available, they tend to be linked to fashion. Mm -hmm. And everyone who's worked in development work knows, then, particularly at the political side, the electorate is very sensitive, politicians come forward, and money is earmarked, particularly in countries that, that have advanced development programs through government sector, 
every decade changes. Activities that are financed through these means, that also means that they only run for a particular period of right. time and they can't outlast the articular original um, objective. Uh, the advantage working for the Aga Khan uh, Development Network is that it's a bit averse of fashion because um, there's one uh, person, core person at the right. helm, the institutions have been established for long periods of time, there are people that tend to stay for long periods, so there's institutional memory, and once, because we are local, uh, once you're in a country, you're there to stay. Right. And that means when you start a project or a program, you have an horizon of 30, 40, perhaps 50 years, perhaps 100 right. years. You're, there's not really anything in, in sight that you say, we'll cut it off precisely right. at that time. That doesn't mean there are no deliverables, they are there. But it's important you can keep the course. Very much a long, long view. But there's a very, yeah. very long-term view in that. Thank yeah, you. That's what yeah. I'd like to share. Nicola, um, I know when I talk to you, you actually could sort of think about it in, in years a little bit. You know, when do you think, the organization is 25 years old? 28. 28 years old. And when along the course of the organization's life did, did, do you feel it started to achieve scale? What's actually really interesting is that I think that we didn't scale for 20 years. Hmm. I mean, the 21st years were really not... Uh, not very impressive. It was like a classical organization. And I think that the, 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 the most difficult part is now over because you can you just imagine for 20, 20 years in the 80s and in the 90s speaking about social enterprise? I we didn't imagine. actually <laughs> spoke about social enterprise because we didn't know the concept yeah. actually of the social enterprise. But for, you know, we were working with public clients. We had public clients and we had private clients on the, in the meantime. For the public sector, we were two uh, for-profit companies. They said, why have you a legal status of uh, like kind of NGO? Because obviously there are there were no status of uh, social enterprise. And then you're, you're like profitable in some way and that's not normal. It shouldn't be like this. And on the other hand, you have the private sector to say, but yes, okay, you, you say that you're profitable, you may be self-sustainable, but uh, on the other hand, you're totally, uh, you, ha you have a social mission and you really, you, you're really looking at your impact and so on, and you can m make more money with your activity, so we're not really interested in that. So I think that it's important that uh, people like, um, the, like uh, Bill Drayden for Ashoka, uh, like uh, the founder of uh, Group SOS, like Mohammed Yunus, like for years and years and years, and it's just not, not only only one year or two years, it's 20 years, they really, and Aga Khan obviously, yeah. but in different ways, um, they really tried to, uh, to develop this concept of social enterprise. So things where after at the beginning of the, 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 this, this, this century were, were really easier for us. And so it's how we achieved to scale because it was more understandable for the private sector and for the public sector what we were doing and that it was uh, possible to have hybrid solutions to fight against poverty and to tackle social issues. So we're going to get to the uh, question that's 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 coming next. But one thing that you just heard is that there w was probably an opportunity that started to arise to begin to achieve that scale. And I want you to talk about that in just a second. But Jean-Philippe, how about you? How long did it take you? You you can measure in slightly shorter years, I think. Well, yes, but we have to put things but in perspective. you have perspective. to go back to your, yeah, all the... <laughs> Be because, uh, yes, starting 2000, 2001, uh, we grew to a, a billion dollar in eight, eight nine years, okay? Yeah. Uh, but uh, two things I'd like to comment there. Uh, one is it's still peanuts compared to the pools of capital out there. So yes, it's scale, but it's not scale, right? So uh, let's be let's remain very very modest about right. that. Um, the second thing is um, we can only grow as fast as absorption capacity by social entrepreneurs and and companies in which we invest. That's that's another very important um, you know factor that I hope we can discuss. Yeah. And last but not least, yes, we grew quickly, uh, but we have been preceded by decades of charity, philanthropic, not-for-profit work, preparing the ground for the commercialization of microfinance. So it's not that we came in a vacuum and suddenly grew to a billion dollar just like that. Many, many international organizations, networks, were right. very active for decades, right. developing microfinance institutions, environment, um, and, and then leveling the playing field from, uh, you know, World Bank and CGAP, et cetera, et cetera. So there were many success factors ar surrounding us that were there. So yes, we, we did it in eight, nine years and we're continuing, but it was just 
at a, a specific point and we were helped by the supportive environment, right? So In a way, what you're saying is that without the, all of those years of enabling um, microfinance to grow to a scalable point, uh, perhaps your model you wouldn't have even thought made sense. Um, and Absolutely. So, yeah, you really had to wait for that opportunity. Go ahead, Nicola. J just, uh, I always compare that like a, a, a software thing that you have to reboot. Yeah. It's exactly like this. <laughs> like for for years and years, we had this software software with philanthropy and then uh, money making, uh, profit making, and then all these people work for years and years and years to all the people. It's like like Jesus. I mean, like going to all the places <laughs> and try to convince all the people and reboot <laughs> all the time the the software of these people, saying that there is not only two. Uh, one alternative, two choices. It is possible to do it in another way. So they were pushing to the button all the time, everywhere, and for years and years. And it's thanks to them that we're now able to scale and to develop and to fight uh, against poverty in this way. Jean-Philippe? And, and if I may, one, one last point. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, one, one last point is um, looking at specifically the nine, ten years of Blodgett Bamboo, we started uh, with um, investors that actually invested just like if they had given away money, okay. right? So yeah. really venture, philanthropy, you know, angel investing, and they were certainly coming at this from uh, impact first rather than finance first type investment. The, the good thing that they, these people realize is that if they uh, were successful in supporting us, we would then develop a model that would attract other types of capital institutional investing right. and when we talk about scale i do believe that we talk about attracting really big right. institutional investing money and um, it takes time it takes track record and it takes people coming for impact first and willing to trust you to build the track record so that you get to scale with institutional investors at least that's our very you know limited experience well, so this, that's a great segue, though, because what, one of the things that I really want each of you to address is um, kind of a combination of something that you just brought up and also this idea about was there an opportunity, whether it was externally or internally, an opportunity that arose where you had a choice to make that allowed you to scale. In other words, was there a specific moment in time or a specific strategic decision or an externality, in fact, that allowed you to? And then the other thing that I want to make sure we come back and talk about is this idea of absorption because it's an extremely important part of the conversation. And if we can do a good job of setting that up for the next couple of days, I know there are going to be a lot of discussions about sort of the capacity side of, of this whole uh, new market. So. Um, any of you who cares to could start by telling me, was there an, a strategic decision, an opportunity, an externality that really allowed the organization to have this growth, this efficient growth, this sort of opportunity to scale? Jordan? Um, uh, one one um, important element I'd like to mention for the, the Aga Khan Development Network was the opportunity that arose in the north of Pakistan um, in the early 1980s, when, uh, particularly in rural development, when uh, new approaches have pioneered. Um, since the independence of Bangladesh, a number of schools of thought have come out and there are a large number of uh, the, the organization of, of Dr. Yunus was mentioned earlier, the Grameen Bank PRAC. Um, there has been a number of approaches in order to kickstart development and find how you could scale that up. The experience of the Aga Khanat in the north was through productive investments and productive physical infrastructure. These uh, uh -huh. provided opportunities for village communities rather than go through a lengthy process of conscientization to almost immediately start and say, right. well, we have an idea. We want an access road. We want an irrigation channel. We want something very solid and very concrete that could be provided as a grant on a first time basis, but the second time it wouldn't come as a grant anymore. So by doing so, you could very quickly scale up. Right. And that concept has since been replicated in other countries with equal levels of success, but in varying circumstances. And we have at the Trust for Culture, where I work, also introduced it in the urban environment. And that first started with, but that would be too long to explain now, yeah. would be with a, <laughs> with a, a large in, involvement yeah. in Cairo. That's a great example, though. I mean, so you were able to uh, sort of take, take advantage of a situation to start to build real infrastructure, and then you could replicate that in other developing countries. Um, we actually, at the beginning of the the, the 2000, uh, we were only 500 people. We're now 10,000 people, so it's quite impressive. <laughs> and if I were in um, in uh, like at the Oscar ceremony, <laughs> I would thank a lot of people. And first of all, I would thank the European Union for having such a for such a conservative and a market-based policy. I want to thank the. 
um, the, the financial <laughs> word for putting us in such a mess. I would like to thank uh, the state that has been unable <laughs> Uh, the French state to modify its system and to make it more sustainable for the social challenges and so on. So actually, it's, we're not responsible for all that, <laughs> uh, but it's, it was just an opportunity without being cynical. It's just to say that obviously the situation, in, we're in a very bad situation uh, in France, but in continental Europe uh, more generally and the indebtedness rates of the states are very very high and we really and that's on the one hand on the uh, on the other hand we really like our social welfare model and we want to bring it uh, forward it's why we elected uh, someone two, two, two days ago is to continue that <laughs> but we have to reinvent this model actually because we don't have the means and the financial means to continue with that so what we try to do with the, the social enterprises for the, the, the state and for the public sector a very good uh, opportunity to complement the existing framework of what exists to fight against poverty without the means they had uh, decades ago and so the opportunity is the economy, I mean. It's this new model to really exactly. take off, yeah. Um, in the interest of making sure we have enough time for all my questions, how about if I ask you to take on this issue of absorption since you raised it a minute ago? Can you talk a little more about that? Um, uh, very simple, I mean, um, we're just an intermediary. Right. Uh, we're just uh, hopefully an efficient intermediary between people willing to invest money and people borrowing or taking that money in their capital to grow. Right. So, um, we quickly realized uh, that you can only channel money, as much money as, as, as you can possibly absorb uh, uh, re uh, reasonably um, at a pace that allows you, uh, as a company on the ground, to, okay, grow quickly, uh, that's all right, but gr grow well, yep. respecting, well, first of all, your clients and your customers, your, all your stakeholders, um, and not putting at threat or at risk the very idea of that you're pursuing by too fast a growth, by weak governance, by right. weak you know management of information, etc. And and we've seen some some problems in microfinance recently um, that are I think examples of probably too fast a growth in some yeah. countries and in some instances. So uh, yes, um, I would uh, if you ask me, in, impact investing is as a great future. But I don't see quite there yet, uh, you know, the trillion dollar the or, the, or the five billion, yeah. five hundred billion dollar at base of pyramid potentially, probably. But I don't, when I look around, I don't see five hundred billion dollars worth of potential investments yeah. tomorrow. And 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 I suspect that much more um, entrepreneurial angel investing venture. Um, we have to go into impact investing before, you know, intermediaries like us, uh, mostly targeting growth stage private equity, uh, will be able to grow find quickly the and fi find the opportunities. I think it's growing. I it's growing. Yeah. Um, but yet, um, I would, I would. Uh, and there's know, probably careful. a lot of interesting discussion that will take place about those who believe that it's just a matter of finding those great deals and those who perhaps like you and I, perhaps, because I would say I'm slightly biased to thinking that we don't quite have the capacity yet for the absorption side of this model, although I'm very optimistic about it. Um, and I think um, that, that, that this creative tension sort of is, is actually quite good, because it's really what we need to focus on in order to grow this market. But the one thing, and then yes, and then, then, then quickly uh, pass yeah. to Nicola. The, the, the one <laughs> thing is, though, if, if in the next two, three, four years, we're capable of spotting the right disruptive business models in yep. different sectors, then replication could right. accelerate the growth. Right to um, our earlier and, speaker, and, and, right. and I'm not saying it's the same approach in every geography or in every market, yet, the, the, you know, uh, companies will have tested ways of um, bringing basic services to the right price point, managing, right. managing growth, right. managing distribution, um, and then I think I think you'll see an exponential growth, but but it's, right. it's we're not there yet. And I happen to know that our our uh, our group here for the next couple of days has a large number of social entrepreneurs in the mix, and so that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to make sure to draw out the entrepreneur, you know, the sort of capacity side. You have. 30 seconds for this because I have a very important question I want to ask before we run out of our, uh, our time. Yeah, I just w I just wanted to add something about that. Obviously, I, I'm always quite afraid when I see that there are lots of intermediaries 
Sorry, but the, and, uh, and I don't see lots of uh, social enterprises and I think that we really have in the future to focus on that and to really to insist on that because it's very difficult for a social enterprise to develop, to scale and so on. And so we're thinking a lot about the market, how we build the market and so on. That's very important. I totally agree. But we have to find these entrepreneurs and all these people as well that are entrepreneurs, but that don't know that they are social entrepreneurs. And we have lots of them. And actually, our deal flow for our investments comes a lot from these people who are building absolutely huge things, but they're not in the, for us in France, in the Parisian world, where we speak a lot about social enterprises and we love social enterprises prices because they have changed the world but there are lots of people everywhere in France doing that are doing things. great things yeah yeah well this is a, actually also a good segue because what I wanted to be sure to draw out from each of you and we talked about this before our, our panel today is to me it's always really important to sort of identify also what didn't go well like what what were what was a, um, a big disappointment that you learned something very important from or what was a uh, an experience you want to be sure that you don't duplicate <laughs> um, something that you could share that would either shorten others you know curves to their scalable opportunity or, or just a really important um, uh, opportunity for yourself and your organization to learn from a mistake or a disappointment Yurian, do you have one that comes to me the one I can I can point at five or six if but necessary. Have it <laughs> no what I really mean to say in general is that or the two. environment in which you work um, you, you don't have that at hand. There are so many different factors that decide things. If I look at the Trust for Culture, what we work, we have projects in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Egypt, and Mali, and Kenya. Recently, I said, well, Syria is really in trouble. We, things are on hold at present. <laughs> Egypt is difficult. Thank God we got Mali. Right. Now, look what happened in Mali. We right. had a coup d'etat. How can you ensure that you can continue activities one way or the other, or at least scale them down to the level that they can be picked up again at one point? That's something you Great have to point. take into account. Great point. So being able to sort of, if you need to, just sort of say, this is not a place where we can actively work right now, but we can stay here and we can reactivate. Uh, we, we actually had a, uh, the, the biggest problem is not in terms of uh, business, I think, because we were we had the chance to, to, to be quite successful for that. But it was more in terms of human resources. And it's absolutely fundamental because it, I think it's the most important thing for an enterprise, for every enterprise and for social enterprises, so of course. It is even more important, and we had we, we faced actually f w w during our scaling up phase we faced actually lots of problems of the people that they were um, at the real beginning of the um, of the the enterprise and they that don't recognize themselves in this new model in this uh, this big corporation they are quite afraid about that they say uh, small is beautiful. Uh, you becoming big, you becoming evil. It's it's kind of things, yeah. uh, even if it's not that simple. But and so we had we had this problem with all these people. We w we haven't been able for a lot of them to convince them that it was a good thing for us to scale to become bigger because we c could have a better impact and a greater impact on the population on the people. And w we haven't been really able to bring them into this uh, this project and they didn't really understand why we should become bigger and bigger and so on and develop the activity and I think that the human resource for scaling up is absolutely fundamental because they are the pillar of the company. Yeah, that's really, really an interesting point. Jean-Philippe? Well, I, I'm afraid I have to repeat what he just said. <laughs> uh, usually I don't do that, but, but, but I, I totally, totally uh, relate to that. Um, I guess the single most important key success factor would be the team and, 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 and quality of people that you have you know, uh, around Everything, you and, yeah. and working. That, that, at least in our uh, activity, that makes 90, 95% of, of, of success. And, and um, as we grow, uh, we have increasingly this natural tension between the investing profiles yeah. and the passionate social entrepreneurship profiles and we have to strike the right combination in the team and in our investment committees, by the way, uh, so that we, we, uh, we, find, we work this fine line of, of dual returns. And, and, and that's a challenge. That's the, the, a, a very important challenge. And that, uh, that happens at the level of team, investment committees, governance. And yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> and I, 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 as we said to one another, I definitely identify with that issue. And I think it, I think um, 
probably each of you sit in positions of leadership where your ability to walk that line gracefully and impart that every day to your your talented team becomes almost the entire job you know it's to, it's for you to really embody that um, that that every single day um, and, and in essence it's almost like you're recruiting every day um, even if you're not actually actively hiring somebody um, so it's a really really important point um, I was signaled that we have a little more time and I, so I have a chance to ask uh, you, you each to sort of comment on one other aspect of this of this topic which is essentially um, is there ever been a point in time when the external environment sort of turned against you? In other words, where success, instead of breeding kind of the the accolades of those that supported you for the first years or who 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 were part of your enabling process, for example, in your case, JP, um, you know, was there a point along the way where any of you can remember that actually part of the external environment gave you a shock? You know, there was a sudden shift, perhaps because you were successful, in fact, or possibly because there was a, a new tr a new trust issue. Anything like that that has been part of your growth? <laughs> there are things that could be on the horizon. I cannot. Um, <laughs> yeah. The way I'm thinking now, particularly about the uh, urban uh, renovation projects that we do, um, we work for public private partnerships, and they tend to be for periods of 25 years. When you come to such an agreement, you're pretty certain, at least we feel certain, that we can negotiate up to a certain level. And generally speaking, then, if people have little, particular local governments, little faith that these will be profitable right. in the end, with the profits right. being returned for other purposes, they tend to be lenient. Um, but of course, if they become successful, then once the lease is over, they certainly would like to renegotiate in a different way, right. but where they want to take a, a larger share of the total, whereas we would say, well, anything that is there in excess is to be used for socioeconomic development, for continuous. Can we be sure the government does that? We don't really know. Yeah. So there's an inherent risk at that. Uh, so you would like to grow, you'd like to grow up a certain level. If you go way beyond that, you're facing a different partner. Yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of I, I thought I was having, was that if we can bring out some of those situations, I think those are really important to kind of share. Um, and no surprise to me that you would be thinking way ahead about where, in particularly in developing countries, the government could be a completely different partner tomorrow than it is today. I had the we had the, actually during our scaling up we were we faced lots of uh, difficulties, especially with the external world, because I think that at a certain point people really began uh, to hate us. I don't know why, but it was really really difficult. They were really critical about what we did because it was not on their software actually, and it was not possible to be a social enterprise and to be big. And so it's, um, uh, and because we have lots of uh, media opportunities, we do lots of things and we explain our job and we try to, but people are so skeptical. I don't know if it's linked to, uh, to, to France or to Latin countries or I don't know what, but we had really, we, we, we faced lots of difficulties with that. We had very, um, in, the, in the magazines and so on, they were always very skeptical about our model and they were always trying to know where is the, where is the money hiding. That's one part, so in the garden somewhere or if the money comes from uh, from the, the the drugs or from uh, from you know, and uh, and so that has been really difficult. And I think that we made a mistake for that, is that we didn't communicate at the really uh, really beginning enough. So we didn't really explain the model uh, that we set up, why we did things like this, how it w works, and so on. And we were just thinking, yeah, we d we're doing our job, we're focused on our social impact, on our financial impact, but uh, uh, mainly on our social impact. So we tried to grow it. It's difficult to scale up, and we have you, you really you in your, your thing, and it's, it's your focus on what you do. And so when you don't speak, people speak for you. Right. And uh, peop lots of people, they become je je jealous and they, they wondering and they have, and they like to invent like beautiful stories and things like this. And that's a real problem. And so I think you have to master your communication. It's really, really important. It's, it's what we try to do because we, and I think it's the same. We discovered uh, uh, His Highness Aga Khan just one year ago. We had the chance to meet him. And we didn't even know about that because, you know, we, we had a very, uh, we were in, yeah, yeah we yeah. were in our world and uh, it was not important. So it's I interesting for us also to go outside, go abroad to see what happens. Another important point. I think so many of us get occupied in being such gr 
practitioners that you sometimes forget that it's important to keep telling your story and then also to make sure that your own network, you know, is always sort of looking out a little bit. Well, impact from the um, environment or external world, uh, clearly uh, it's, uh, it's almost every day for us because again, we're intermediaries yeah. and we talk to investors and the yeah. financial world. So whatever happens in the financial world, one way or another impacts Back us, right? You, yeah. So. For instance, um, 2005, 2006, we were very happy and actually proud to have uh, developed the first CDO in microfinance, well, okay, structured finance product in, mi in microfinance. We had sort of educated S&P on microfinance and got the first rating ever in right. microfinance. Um, we had Morgan Stanley structuring this, this, <coughs> the, the, this, this product. 2008, you know, housing crisis in the US and CDO became a bad word, right? So difficult, uh, even though you're not related uh, to the right. type of, uh, of movements that happen in the market, you are assimilated because you use the same instrument. Okay, that was one. Of course, now investors, most of them at least, are sitting on their cash. Right. <laughs> you know, so right, we're, you're we're frustrated the other way. We're willing yeah. to fundraise. <laughs> we're saying that we have investment capacity, that uh, you know, we, we have dual returns track record, that um, we can put this money to work efficiently, that we can get the returns that they're willing. Most of them would say, too good to be true. Let's see in a couple of years. Right. You know, go no ahead. No hurry. In, no <laughs> worry. Go ahead in the meantime. So that's that's tough. Very difficult. And today's difficult environment. Very yeah. difficult. Um, I think we have an, uh, about 10 minutes left. Is that what the signal was? Five minutes. So we have time for questions. Um, and if it's all right with all of you, I think it would be great to turn to questions and see if there are some from the audience. And I, we have very bright lights here, so we may not uh, see all of you. So wave your hand around. You, right there, with the hand waving, the bl blonde hair, I think. Thank you. Oh, the runner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Bruce Wilson. I came out here from California, and my question is for uh, Nicola and Jean-Philippe. Uh, you talked about intermediary organizations, and you were so like, worried about that, and then there's the absorption issue. What pragmatic steps are you sort of taking to create those strategic partnerships where you can source those entrepreneurs, uh, or are you? And have you considered that option? Well, um, you see, when we started Bamboo five years ago, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I, at least, had no clue about where we would put this money to work and how. Uh, we didn't know whether we would do debt or private equity or mezzanine. We didn't know whether we would do venture, early stage, seed, growth. Over time, um, since we're an intermediary and, and we want the whole value chain to be sustainable, we have to be sustainable as well. And as intermediaries, we can only be sustainable if we are in the growth stage, private equity segment. Um, I cannot run uh, an asset management company for profit with zero subsidies from the start on a very lean budget if I do pure venture on a global scale from Geneva, Luxembourg, Bogota or Singapore. We need to decentralize. So to answer your question, um, anytime, well, sourcing the deals is, is, uh, is sort of easy now. I mean, we, we have like five or 600, you know, uh, uh, solicitations per year coming at us and, and we of course then then right. depending on our criteria we, we okay. select and we funnel um, very very drastically what we're trying to do now is to have uh, partners um, as you know sister organizations to which we can uh, send um, those applicants that do not qualify for growth stage so that they would get you know help in terms of you know early stage kind of capital seed looking for. angel yeah. we're, we're we're not capable yet um, at Bamboo to answer, you know, early stage uh, uh, needs. The one thing we're, we we are willing to experiment right now, and we're building that right now. Actually, is is the local, you know, venture fund. Um, we're we're willing to launch one in Colombia in the next few months. And the idea there is to say, okay, if we cannot do it from Geneva on a global scale venture, maybe we can have local resources, you know, at a much lower scale, much lower cost, and at earlier stage for for the pipeline that we can then, you know. Uh, uh, invest and then eventually possibly graduate in growth stage private equity for the, from the global funds. 
it's going to take a long time. In the meantime, unfortunately, we have to pass on, you know, uh, entrepreneurs to to other organizations. That's 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 what we're trying to do. So it sounds like your question and Jean-Philippe's answer are are slightly different. But it, what it sounds like is that you have a pipeline for for the the later stage deals that you're looking for. You have plenty. You're you're always in the process of finding the one you'll actually invest in. But what you're trying to do is a little bit the reverse, which is feed the venture and seed stage investors some of those deals that come to you that aren't aren't right for you. Um, Quick and we'll probably quick, or else we won't have time for any more questions. So my my answer is quite the same, but uh, it's just to to say that the, we, yeah, we beside our activity of social enterprise, we set up this impact investing fund, and we are on the growth stage as well. But to find the, and we're now launching one, for example, in Korea and in Japan, because uh, there is the, the social business are developing everywhere, and uh, and there are opportunities everywhere, and we don't really have this problem of uh, of the deal flow. I don't know why, but I, I cannot explain it. But maybe because I think that we have a really open vision of what a social or enterprise is, all the different possibilities, and you have all all the time you need to find your pipeline to speak with the right person. Uh, for example, in French, in France, the network is definitely uh, the the big associations and the big NGOs. They know each other. They know all the people. They know the situation, and so they bring the deal. When you go to Korea, for example, you have to speak with the government because all the social enterprises are listed, and there is a strong uh, there, there are tax incentives for social enterprises in Korea, and it's the same in Japan. So that so. The, all the, the government and the Ministry of uh, Economy, he knows exactly where the social enterprises are. So in e every country you have a different uh, way of s sourcing uh, uh, um, uh, social enterprises, but we have lots of uh, opportunities. So, and this is a very, we're going to go to one more question, but I think this is a really important, again, kind of a creative tension between one point of view, which is, you know, how can investors do more to make sure that we, the entrepreneurs, are fed into a pipeline and often from the investor side, Particularly for those investing in later stage, the answer is, well, we have we have this pipeline. It's it's no longer a problem to have the pipeline. Our problem is we have to filter the pipeline. And so, you know, it's a very interesting, there's a reason that that question is out there. And we need to keep trying to discuss it, I think, and find the answers that, because I think they're both issues and they're just different. One more question? That's fine. And I'd love to take more, but I think we only have time for one. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Nihar. I work with a media company in India. That's where I come from. Uh, I, I hear two things here. One uh, being that there are two uh, pools of people. Before, there were people doing business, and there were people doing NGO. And now we're talking about a middle ground where it merges. And I also hear John saying that it's still not even the tip of the iceberg, because we haven't touched enough. I just want if each one of you can tell if you've worked with any existing companies or NGOs, which are huge, but created and helped them become social enterprise and measure beyond money. And they already exist as huge organizations and companies, could be purely capitalistic or business. But are there examples in your areas of work where you've picked up something from the past and they've existed for 50, 60, 70 years, and then help them measure more and have a massive impact? So. So if I got if the I question did. right, I think I did. It's have any of you experienced uh, sort of looking at an institution that's probably been around for a while that is just it's an enterprise in country wherever that is and helped it become more aware of its social impact and really turned it into a social enterprise. Go ahead, Nicola. It's very interesting because it's exactly what I did last week uh, in Korea because we the the, the big corporation uh, the big Korean corporation like Samsung, SK. Uh, Hyundai and so on, they want to turn into this social enterprise kind of thing and there are, are strong incentives for the government from the government actually to do so. So it's because certainly of communication things, they want to set up social enterprise, so they identified us as a model of social enterprise in rich and developed countries. So they asked us to come to Korea to one, set up social enterprise and two, to measure their social impact. And it's really funny because we're now trying to make a proposition for them, like uh, they're huge uh, companies, like they're really conglomerate, so it's really difficult to measure the social impact, <laughs> and they have no social impact, I mean, def at, at the end. But, you know, it's always difficult to 
the, the concept of the uh, of a social impact is very complicated because you have this SRI thing of uh, so social responsible enterprises, uh, and then you have the social impact, and that then you're speaking about two very different things. And in lots of uh, countries and lots of places, and for lots of company, they they always they mix it up and they think it's quite the same, even if it's not the same. But so you, what we try to explain to them is to say you can do SRI, that's fine, you can be listed for that, that's a good thing, that's a good first step, but if you really want to have a social impact and to go further uh, on that, like Danone, Veolia and uh, other lots of uh, companies, you have to set up your own social en enterprise department, so it's what we try to do and to push them to do so. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, two two things. One <laughs> is one I guess is we're very 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 quickly. Heart, so. One is um, <laughs> it, it really depends on your definition of social enterprise and what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, we come at, at at impact investing with a very um, uh, specific definition. We our investment universe right. are those companies whose intrinsic business model right. is to deliver this good or this service, right? So it's not something they do on the side or, uh, or is peripheral. Add on as a little so extra, uh, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So, so, so that's one one thing. Um, the other is, uh, though, uh, to answer the question, we are now working with a, a great company in South Africa uh, in the, the managed care business uh, that was uh, it's actually quite significant, um, but targeting essentially the, the, the middle income segment. And, and we have invested in this company because they have strategically decided to go to the lower income segment, right. but doing what they do uh, and, bringing uh, and, what they, and bringing it out and, and very efficiently. And, um, that's, I think, something that could also accelerate impact. That's a great example, I think. That's one and example. You're, you're probably going to have, <laughs> unless you want Rosalie personally to come get us, you have probably have, <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have probably have a, a very brief answer. Phones once upon a time. <laughs> I'm done, so. uh, no, I have to uh, refer to the Aga Khan uh, Fund for Economic Development, where there are countless yeah. examples. Uh, but I could think about utility companies such as Energie du Mali. Uh, I could think about the bean processing plant in Kenya. Or that. Many of companies, sometimes they are started up by themselves from the existing entities, right. which there's a, sometimes some collaboration, and they, they are left to themselves again. Yeah, thank you, because I think you do have some very clear examples in the foundation. Um, well, I want to thank my colleagues for a terrific way of starting the morning, and thank all of you. And I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions, but thank you very much, gentlemen. Mm -hmm.